Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to take a moment to share this on social media, and we will get rolling. I, uh, I'm broadcasting not from Bozeman, but from my hotel room in Great Falls, Montana, in the Windy City. I don't know why they call Chicago the Windy City. It's definitely Great Falls. Um, I uh, came here to do some work for Kosher. I have many in the bed right next to me. Um, but we're going we're gonna to learn some Torah. You can learn Torah from wherever you are, even a hotel room in Great Falls. So give me a second here to share this. Here we go. Uh, one share. Good evening, Linda. Good evening, Danielle. Copy link. And we're almost ready. Here we go. Okay. Make sure everyone's muted. Oh, good evening, Yosef. What a beautiful surprise. Okay. We are live. It is the portion of Chaye Sora, the Torah, the fifth portion in the book of Genesis. And the portion begins, you know, with perhaps a sad experience. It begins with the passing of our matriarch, uh, Sarah, the first Jewess. Abraham was the first Jew and uh, Sarah was the first Jewish, the first Jewish woman, the founding mother of the Jewish people. And after she's buried in the city of Hebron, which uh, for those that don't know, uh, this Shabbos in the city of Hebron, it's a very big, uh, I'm going to move the light over, so there you go, a little bit more clarity. Um, for the, in Israel, th- tens of thousands of Jews go to spend Shabbat in Hebron, right near the burial place of our matriarchs and patriarchs in Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah, which we read about in this week's to- Torah portion, a- Abraham and Sarah are buried there, Isaac and Rebecca are buried there, Adam and Eve are buried there, Jacob and Leah are buried there. Of course, Rachel's buried in Bethlehem and Bethlehem because she died. She passed away while they were traveling. But it's, it's the place where even Caleb, when they went to Israel, the spies, that's where he went to pray. And so after she passes and after Abraham purchases a plot of land in, in Hebron for her burial, the verse says as follows, and I'm going to read some of it inside because I think it's very important not to get caught up, not to forget about the basic understanding before we get into deeper understandings of the verse. So it says as follows, Abraham was old, but still immersed in daily life. God had blessed Abraham with everything, including a son, which is, of course, he blessed him with a son, Isaac. Abraham said to his servant, the senior member of his house, who was in charge of everything he had, please place your hand under my thigh to swear an oath. I will make you swear by God, the God of the heavens and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among who I live. So even though he was living in the land of Israel, which was then ruled by the Canaanites, which were not a very particularly Jewish-friendly group of people, nevertheless, even though it was convenient, Abraham said, I want to make it clear to you, my servant, that A, I know what's cooking, B, don't try to trick me, you're my servant, and you're going to do what I ask, and I don't want my son Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman. Rather, you should go to the land, to my birthplace, and you will take a wife for my son, for Isaac." The servant said to him, what if the woman will not want to follow me to this land? Shall I take your son back to the land from where you came? Should I take Isaac to outside of Israel? And of course, we know, for those that study the Torah, that Isaac never left Israel. He was an Ola Tmima. Jacob left Israel. Abraham left Israel. Abraham went to Egypt. Jacob went to, to Lavan, to his uncle in, in Haran. Isaac never left Israel. So, But Eliezer, being a uh, devoted servant, a devoted servant to his master, Abraham says, what if the woman doesn't want to come? Shall I take your son there? Right? How often do we see in marriages that the uh, couples move to places they don't want to move because they, they're in love? So Eliezer, doing his due diligence, says to Abraham, what if the girl doesn't want to come? What if I find the right girl, but the, white wo- the right woman, but she wants Isaac to come to her? Abraham said to him, be insistent not to take my son back there. God, the God of the heavens, who took me from my father's house in Haran and from the land of Ur, where I was born, who spoke to me about my needs and swore to me at the covenant of the part saying, I will not give this land to your descendants. I'm sorry, I will give this land to your descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you and you will take a wife from my son from there. If the woman doesn't want to follow you, then you will be absolved from the oath of mine, but don't take my son back there. The servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and made him the oath. And so then the, the verses continue that... You know, Eliezer, on behalf of Abraham, took a lot of gifts, a lot of dowry, if you wish, to give Rebekah, to give the eventual wife that he would find for um, for Isaac. And he comes and he makes a, a plan in his head. He says, I'll know that it's the right woman if I come there um, when the women are, are drawing water from the well. 
And whoever tells me that I'll give you water and I will give water to your camels, which is a lot of water to give camels, then I'll know that it's the right one. Which is interesting, out of all the character traits that, that, I, that Eliezer and Abraham could have planned for, you know, what do you want to find in a wife for Isaac who's going to be the second matriarch of the Jewish people? You think holiness, spirituality. No, the number one thing on the list was her level of generosity and kindness. Holiness is important. And by the way, Rebecca was extremely noble and spiritual and holy. She lived amongst, we're going to talk about that soon. But the reality is that the first thing that he looked for was what type of kindness she has. The Talmud actually tells us that we learn about the character trait of a person based on their kindness. And that sometimes even wicked people, there's a whole tract that I'm studying now with Seth in our shul. On Monday, we study Talmud. And um, the Talmud says that even wicked people Right? Let's say there's someone that's extremely wicked and they're deserving of a lot of punishment. But if God sees that they happen to have a trait of kindness, that despite their wickedness as it relates to a lot of things, they happen to be kind and generous people, God sort of closes his eyes to their wickedness because of their generosity and kindness. God has a soft spot for people that are generous and kind. And with Rebecca, it was a no-brainer. She, she, she followed through exactly on what Eliezer had in mind and she literally offered... Um, water for the camels as well. And it's interesting that the Torah almost never repeats. The Torah almost never repeats extra words, extra verses. It's clear, it's straightforward. But here, when it comes to the story of Abraham sending Eliezer to find the wife for Isaac, not only does the Torah tell us every detail of how he found the wife, which again tells us that when it comes to matchmaking, details matter. But more importantly, it's repeated a second time because when, when Eliezer, the servant, is telling um, Rebecca's father, Besuel, and his brother Laban about the whole process, he says, oh, and the, by the way, and this is what I brought with me, and these are the gifts, and this is what happened, I met your daughter at the well, and blah, blah, blah. He's repeating the whole thing. That's how important this story is for the trajectory of the Jewish people and the importance of finding that wife and the proper wife for Isaac. But what's also interesting, and that's where I want to take you on a little journey a journey that, um, that, the, that sort of uh, start, this is discussed by the Rebbe in a talk of this week's Parsha at the end of 1952. So in the fall of 1952, Parsha's Chayesara, the Rebbe of blessed memory addressed this story in the following way. He says, first of all, the first wedding mentioned in the Torah clearly, the first match mentioned in the Torah is the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah. Even though there's hints to the marriage of Adam and Eve, there's maybe even a hint, if you want, to the marriage of Abraham and Sarah, the actual, deliberate, clear verses in the Torah that talk about a marriage is the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, Yitzchak and Rivka. And when Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, arrives in Aram Naharayim, he arrives in that border area between Syria and Turkey, and he says, He says, I came today. Now, according to, to travel rules, it's a 17-day trip to get from where Isaac was, where Eliezer was living with Abraham in southern Israel, to get to the border of Syria and Turkey. It's a 17-day trip. And yet Eliezer had this incredible miracle. It says, I came today. Rashi says, quoting from the Talmud, from the Medrash, Hayoyim Yatsasi, Hayoyim Basi. I left Israel today and I arrived today. From here we know that he had what's called in, in, uh, in Torah terms, he had what's called Kfitzata Derech, which means he had a running path, which means he did something, a miraculous travel term, right? That even though normally it would take 17 days to get from Israel to where he was going, he did it in one day. Very nice. It's a great Rashi. It's a great Medrash. The question is for what? What was the need? We don't do miracles, right? The Talmud tells us you're never supposed to do a miracle for no reason. What was the reason that God needed to perform a miracle? That God needed to perform a miracle for, for the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah? Couldn't he just take 17 days to go there? He'll get there. He'll find Rebekah and bring her back. What was the emergency? Not only was it what was the emergency, what was the emergency that necessitated 
that they have to have this miracle of Kvitzas that the, uh, a trip that takes, imagine I told you the, you know, the Concord doesn't exist anymore. I heard it's coming back. But imagine I said that you went from Billings to, to Kalispell in an hour and 20 minutes. So either you have a private jet or you had a miracle. But for what? What was the point of the miracle? And so here's where it gets interesting. So there's an interpretation, explanation that's very, very, I don't want to use the word dry because nothing in the Torah is dry, but very technical. There's a very technical reason for why Abraham needed to create a miracle for Eliezer to get to the well in Aram Narayim, to get to the well in Syria, Turkey, to find the wife for Isaac. There's, there's the practical reason. But then there's a much deeper more mystical, more inspiring reason. So let's start with the technical reason. What's the technical reason for why Eliezer had to come on the same day? So when Abraham sent Eliezer, let's get a few things out of, out of the way. When Abraham sent Eliezer, his servant, he wrote a shtar matana, the Medrash tells us. He wrote a document of gifting. He gifted his entire, all his possessions, his entire wealth to his son, Isaac. What, why was he doing that? It was a way for him to convince Rebecca's family that it's a worthwhile endeavor, that there's a man back, there's a young man, 40 years old, back in Israel, who's a son of Abraham. He has incredible wealth because his father just gifted him. Here's the document he gifted him. He said, here, Harold Ishtar Matani showed him the document. He said he gave all his wealth to him. And that would be an inspiration for him, to, for Rebecca and her family. Maybe not Rebecca, because she was a holy person. She was a good person, but maybe her, her father, her wicked father and her wicked brother to say, oh, maybe it's worthwhile for Rebecca to go. She'll be very wealthy. So even though he wrote a document, here's the problem. In halacha, in Jewish law, there's a lot of laws about how you write a document. Just like in secular law, there's a lot of rules about documents, although nothing close to, for example, the tractate of Gittin, the tractate in the Talmud that talks about divorce and kiddushin about marriage has so many details about how you can go wrong in writing a document that you better be sure you have the most senior, proficient rabbis there when you write that document, because otherwise it could be totally nullified in five seconds. But Abraham understood that if he writes a document with a date that's earlier than the date that's needed, it's called a shtar mukdam, right? He could have wrote a document for 17 days earlier and then let Eliezer go to find the wife under natural terms, and he would get there. But the problem with that is he would be giving away all of his wealth 17 day, at least 17 days prior to when it was needed to be given away because there was no matchmaking going on at that point. And in Judaism, there's a rule about being careful about your wealth, not to throw it in the garbage. And by giving away all his money prior to when it was needed to be given away, he could be signing himself up for a disaster if indeed Eliezer doesn't find a wife. Why? Because already he, he, he preempted it by giving away his wealth. And so if he gives the guy a document of a 17 days, he's roaming around with a document that basically all of Abraham's wealth that he inherited from Avimelech and from Pharaoh when they gave him wealth because they tried to abuse Sarah multiple times and they gave him gifts to get him to be quiet and to go away. If he would have written that 17 days earlier, it would have been a problem. What if he would write a later date? What if he would write the document 17 days early but put a date for 17 days later? In Allah, that's called a shtar mu'ukhar. It's called a delayed document. And even though Allah, it may be kosher, it's not straightforward. Because Laban and Psuel can say, hold on, how did he sign a document seven, for today's date when he sent you out of Israel 17 days ago? Right. So even, what are you going to do? Start explaining to wicked Psuel and Laban that Allah, it's permitted? So you don't want to create a scenario either where his wealth will be given away without the necessary reality of a marriage and also that you wouldn't create a reality where the wicked people of Aram Narayim, Besuel and Lavam would come and say, this Abraham guy is a trickster, he's signing documents on the wrong date, it's not the right date, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Therefore, Abraham signed the document on that day and miraculously sent Eliezer so that Eliezer will arrive on that day. And in order that Besuel and Lavan shouldn't look at the document and go, whoa, how is it possible that you have the same date? You just arrived today. It's impossible you came today. He beat them to it. He preempted them. He said, I came today. He says, I want you to know I left today and I came today because I had a miracle. So that is the technical reason for why, I mean, if you study the Code of Jewish Law and Chaysha Mishpah, the laws of documents and the laws of uh, 
of uh, loans and the laws of, uh, of anything to do with uh, business contracts. You'll see there's these, these very common laws about how to write a document and how to date a document. And so to preempt all these issues and to circumvent, not to circumvent, but to get out of this problem, he sent them with a miracle. That's, for lack of a better term, the dry, the technical reason for why he did it. But then, of course, there's chassidus. And without chassidus, we'd be a bunch of lumps of clay that would try to understand Torah in a very, very dry, um, a, a very superficial, I would say, even, because it's all, it's an external facet, right? Primius of Torah, the internal, the, 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 um, the esoteric part of the Torah is esoteric. You get deeper. It's the depth of the Torah that connects with the depth of the soul. And we want to touch the soul. It's a... We live in a dark exile in a world with a lot of darkness. And if you want to shine in the darkness, we got to go deep. And so that's where Chassidus comes along. And so that brings us to reason number two for why the miracle was needed in order for Eliezer to go the same day. So, just checking on my boy. Um, so, it says that Rivka, Rebecca, living in her father Besuel's home, was Kishoshana, Ben hachoichim, which means like a rose amongst thorns. She lived with wicked people. We all know someone that either grew up or currently lives in unfortunate circumstances where they are good people, maybe even holy people, but they're surrounded by um, human catastrophes. They're surrounded by people that are not a benefit for their spiritual well-being, for their mental well-being, for their emotional well-being, for their holy well-being, for their goodness well-being, for their righteousness well-being. And Rivka was Kishayshana, the original. She was the original Shayshana ben Achaychim, the rose amongst thorns. Now what's interesting about the rose amongst thorns, this is what the Medrash tells us, is that contrary to public belief, the rose needs the thorns in order to succeed. In order to grow beautifully, the rose grows nicer because it has the protection of the thorns. Yet, there comes a time where the rose needs to escape that protection, needs to escape the challenges that make it the incredible rose that it is. Right? There's a lot of beautiful flowers, but a rose, right? You want to impress someone romantically, you bring them roses. Why? Because roses is a reflection of of, of love, of, of goodness that comes even when there's challenges, which is why it makes sense that you would give it in a, in a married couple. Because married couples, by definition, have challenges. And so by bringing the roses, you're saying, despite our challenges, I love you. At least that's what it means most of the time. I'm not referring to the few times that husbands bring it to solve problems that they created that have nothing to do with the uh, normal form of marriage. So R Rivka was like a rose. She grew up protected, meaning her growth and her, she was defined almost in the sense of holiness because of all the challenges that she experienced. But yet there came a time where time was up, meaning either she gets out now or she's going to remain forever trapped by the thorns. And that day happened, the day that she became eligible to marry Isaac. She reached the age Right, according to the measure, she was three years old, even though she didn't get married for another 10 years, but she became eligible to be betrothed. Whatever the age was, it was the moment that she became eligible for Isaac, it would be a crime against humanity to have a child that should be extricated, that should be taken out of the thorns, keep her there one extra day when she wasn't needed there anymore because she was needed to be with, she needed to be with her Isaac. And so the minute that happened, right, Abraham had that recognition. Oh my gosh. Today's the day that she needs to be taken out. Today's the day that she has to be rescued. Today's the day that the rose needs to leave the thorns and move on to a greater, more spiritual, more holy environment. So what did Abraham, to Abraham tell Eliezer? El artsi vel maladeti telech. Go to my land and to my place of birth. Go take a wife for my son for Isaac. Right? He couldn't send him earlier because earlier wasn't a time for extricating him. For extricating her. It wasn't time for her to come out. So you can't make a miracle when it isn't needed. Why would you send them early? Waste his time to go sit around. It wasn't time. The minute the vibes, the energetics, the vibrations hit Abraham, the divine prophecy, the divine revelation hit Abraham, and he realized, okay, it's time to take her out. She's ready to roll. There was no time to waste. It had to be in a miraculous way. He had to go that day, come that day, and extricate her that day. 
begin the process of betrothal by giving her, by the way, he gave her various jewelry, which each piece of jewelry he gave her a nose ring and he gave her various forms of jewelry. Each one of them represented a different spiritual aspect of the bond between her and Isaac, the bond between the Jewish people and God. But they had to come right away. And by the way, that's why you see that when he finally meets her father, right? And her father says, Teshevi Hanayre Tanu Yami let her stick around with us for another few years, another decade or so. Right? I don't mind if you take Rebecca. Why now? What does he say there? He says, I came today. I came with a miracle. There's a reason I came today. And that is because she needs to get out of here today. Every extra minute she's with you is a waste of this beautiful, beautiful soul that does not belong locked up or trapped by the thorns that are going to stop her growth. At a, to, at a certain, you know, for a certain amount of time, the thorns create, for a certain amount of time, the thorns create a reality where it helps you grow. It makes you be a better version of yourself, but then at a certain point, it just becomes harmful. What do they call it in the court system? Punitive. In Judaism, there's no such thing as punitive. So once the time is up for Rebecca to grow as a rose due to the thorn, she needs to leave the roses and come out. And it's fascinating that this story of Rebecca and Eliezer, Eliezer finding Rebecca for Isaac, is repeated twice in the Parsha. Why? Because it's a reminder to us, number one, that when it's time for the Jews to leave this exile, when the moment comes where God says, it's enough of my roses being amongst the thorns, it's going to happen. I was recently reading the incredible, um, the incredible book written by Rabbi Shalom Arthur Rabashkin from Iowa, who was incarcerated in, a, in an incredible um, amount of anti-Semitism. And most people in America don't know about the details of the anti-Semitism because the media never reported it. But I don't walk around just defending everyone that's arrested and everyone that's uh, sentenced to jail. But I happen to know a lot about that case. And I'm comfortable to say that the anti-Semitism there is actually a little scary for this country. But one of the things that's fascinating that I read, I'm not going to, it's a 500, 600 page book. One of the fascinating things is that he, he was lighting menorah in his jail cell on the last day of Hanukkah. And just like that, the warden comes to his cell and says, we need you in the office. And they come and tell him that he's been pardoned or, or commuted, whatever, whatever the term was. And it was literally, when we say Yeshua, Hashem, Keheref, Ayin, that the salvation of God is like by the blink of an eye, that it was meant to happen, it was boom, out the door. All the lawyers and all the appeals, nothing worked. But when it, me- when it was meant to happen, it's not like it took a long time. It happened instantly. With Rebecca, it happened instantly. The minute she needed to leave the thorns, boom. And the same thing is going to happen with Golos. When we sit today in this world of Golos, all of us, I don't care who you are, I don't care how holy you think you are, I don't care how spiritual you are, There's so much doom and gloom out there. There's so many reasons that they scare us into thinking that the world is coming to an end. What was that book I read when I was a kid? Chicken Little, a little chicken. I forgot already where the heaven is falling. Chicken Little, I think, right? Someone shake your head. Tell me I'm not crazy. Chicken Little, okay. Ducky Lucky and Honey Henny Penny. It was a long time ago in the doctor's office. I read it in the waiting room, right? And today, every day they tell us the heaven is falling. There's a supply chain issue. We're not going to have food soon. There's not going to be gas. There won't be cars. The whole world's going to hell. Says the Torah that when it's time for Rivka to get out of the thorns, it doesn't even take a split second. That day, Eliezer shows up miraculously and redeems them. And so, just like we saw by the Exodus from Egypt, what do we see by Egypt? We saw that it says, right? In the middle of the day, they, they were sitting literally at one minute, they were, they were uh, slaves in Egypt, right? Totally enslaved for how many years? 210 years and 80 years of harsh slavery. And then, boom, Moshe says we're going out, and out we go. And just like that, the Jewish people marched their way out of Mitzrayim, and there wasn't time for any, uh, anything, to, anything to change in that process. It was just out the door you go. So no chachmas, no, no maybe, no a little, maybe soon you'll get out, maybe later you'll get out. No, arise, five seconds later, out the, out the door you go, and you're free. And so it's vital, number one, to remember that even when the darkness of the exile seems very, very dark and almost insurmountable, we have to remember that God knows that the right moment had to take us out. But more importantly, we have to remember that when we encounter thorns, 
when we encounter the thorns in our life, when we feel like the world is coming out again, let's forget about collectively, individually, when we feel like, oy vey, our life is falling apart, when we feel like, oy, I can't handle it anymore, the thorns are too, too prickly, they're poking me too much, you have nothing to worry about, you have to have bitachin, you have to have trust, that at the right moment, when it's exactly the time for the rose to be extricated from the thorns, that's exactly when you will be extricated. Not a minute before, not a minute later. It will happen exactly as it's meant to happen, just like it happened for Rebecca. So yes, of course, Rebecca was a unique soul. She was a matriarch of the Jewish people, but she was a matriarch, which means she has something to teach all of us, her descendants. And that is number one, what we learned earlier, the incredible level of generosity. She was an incredibly kind, generous woman. Girl. Even as a girl, she was incredibly generous, incredibly kind. And she didn't think twice before having to, to schlep out, you know, to draw uh, who knows how many gallons of water, right? They forgot we made, a, we made a calculation once of how many gallons of water it takes to feed a camel, to, to, give, to quench the thirst of a camel. She was, he had 10 camels. Right? He's busy, she's busy giving water to 10 camels and to Eliezer, and she did that happily. It wasn't like today. She's not like she bought them water in Hebes. She had to never draw it from the well. Right? That's a hard job. She was a young kid. But she was so devoted to generosity and kindness, she was happy to do that. But secondly, is that when the kind people of the world and the good people of the world find themselves surrounded by thorns, don't become dejected. Don't give up. Hopelessness is easy. It's the easy way out. Why do I say that? Most people are not happy when they're hopeless. But if you choose the option, it's much harder to fight with hope, to fight with trust, to fight with faith, to fight for goodness and kindness. It's much easier to give up hope because then you're a victim. That's not the Jewish path. Rebecca didn't do it. We shouldn't do it. And when the exile looks scary, just remember they went out of Egypt and they went out of Aram Naharayim in the, and they went out of Otisville in the split of an eye, in the, in the blink of an eye, boom! Just like that. You'll be sitting one day sipping your latte, watching your Fakakta news that's depressing you, and you're checking your stocks to make sure you have your futures and it's all figured out. And as they come, boom! You're going to hear a shofar blowing. You're going to hear the blast of a shofar. Koil mevaser, mevaser v'yoymer. Koil mevaser. There's going to be a screaming announcement. Pronunci- you know, a pronouncement that Hine Elio. Elio Hanavi Zohar Latoyv Elijah the prophet remembered for good is going to appear and usher in the era we've been waiting for, hoping for, praying for, trusting in. It's going to happen. So someone wrote now on Facebook that sure, he came out of the blink of an eye, but he was in jail for like eight years. That's not, that's exactly my point. You're only in there as long? My son is turning off the light, so we're getting a state of darkness. It's bedtime. So if we go dark, it's not, it's not the uh, spectrum, it's just my son going to bed. Come say good night. Good night, love So, exactly the point. Eight, eight years, but when it's meant to happen, boom, just like that. And the same thing is with almost 2,000 years of exile since the second temple. When it's meant to happen, it's going to happen. And no matter what Fox and, M- and MSNBC and CNN and this pundit and Yenna pundit and this Chacham and that Chacham tells us the trajectory and the, what, what do they call the, the inflation, the super duper inflation and the hyperinflation and all the doom and gloom. Remember, we are Am Yisrael. Sure, it could be we'll have to deal with challenges, but don't become dejected. Yesh balabayis lebirazu. There is a master of this palace. There is a master of this world. And he runs it perfectly. And if you live with that, then at the right moment, like Rebecca, you'll be extricated from the thorns. We'll all be extricated from our collective thorns. With the coming of Moshiach Tzadkenu, may be spewing in our days. Amen. Have a rock and rest of the week. Zay gesund. Keep smiling, keep fighting, keep hoping, keep praying. Vanish the spell. Don't become hopeless. Hopeless is for, not for the Jews. Jews don't become hopeless. We remain connected. 
we remain on fire and everything will f fall exactly where it needs to. Zeigesund.